Welcome to the fabulous 23rd Annual Academy Awards. I'm Robert Humperdunk. And I'm Margot Charming. And welcome to the Red Carpet Ceremony. Well, this is a banner year for film with stiff competition for both the Best Actor and Best Actress categories. Oh, and let's not forget the Best Picture categories. All About Eve has received a record 14 statue nominations, beating out the previous record held by Gone with the Wind in 1939. Well, how about that, Margot? Let's not forget that All About Eve also is only the second film in history to receive five nominations for acting. The first one was Mrs. Miniver way back in 1942. And let's not forget All About Eve has multiple nominations in both the Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress categories. Wow, that is a lot of gold. I hope they brought a wheelbarrow. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. Well, let's talk about that loaded Best Actress category. There's Eleanor Parker in Cage, Judy Holliday in Born Yesterday, Ann Baxter in All About Eve, Betty Davis in All About Eve, and Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard. Who would have thought women had that much talent? How about that Best Actor category? Well, that's just as loaded. First up, we've got Lewis Calhoun in The Magnificent Yankee. We've got Jimmy Stewart in Harvey, William Holden in Sunset Boulevard, Spencer Tracy in Father of the Bride, and let's not forget everybody's favorite to win, Jose Ferrer for Cyrano de Bergerac. Wait a minute, isn't it pronounced Jose Ferrar? I'm not sure. Well, I'll say Ferrar. And I'll say Ferrer. This competition is almost Too exciting to stand. Too hot to handle. (laughs) Oh, I'm getting a signal. Oh, yes. They're about to announce the best actor category. Let's go inside and see who's going to win. And now, may I have the envelope, please? The winner is Jose Ferrer and Mr. Ferrer is not in the house, but as Fred Astaire said, there is a group waiting to hear results in New York at the other end of an open ABC circuit. I'm sure Jose is with them. How about it, Mr. Ferrer? Have you anything on your mind? Ladies and gentlemen, here we are in New York, and now here is our winner, Mr. Jose Ferrer. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. 3,000 miles away. Hello, my dear, beloved Helen Hayes. How wonderful to hear your voice. And I know it's kind of conventional to thank people, but I'm going to be conventional because I'm sincere. All of you who are connected with this picture, Stanley, Mike, Carl, Frank Planner, George, Mala, Bill Prince, Morris Karnofsky, all of you, you know as well as I do that it's your Oscar as much as it is mine. Also to you, ladies and gentlemen of the Academy, who voted for me, you must know that this means more to me than just the honor accorded to an actor. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for what I consider a vote of confidence and an act of faith, and believe me, I will not let you down. And one more thing, I think the most important winner of all tonight is the man with a long nose himself who has written victoriously through the pages of dramatic literature for over 50 years, and this is just the beginning for Cyrano de Bergerac. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Ferrer, here in New York. Oh, no, not again. Hi, I'm Adam. And I'm Charlotte. And welcome, welcome to, to Perf, Perf Damage. Damage. 
the weekly podcast hosted by a movie-obsessed husband and wife team who work in the film industry. We'll share stories of film production and restoration. We'll review and recommend. We'll examine the minutia of subgenres and even microgenres. And most importantly, we will tackle the art of the double feature. Just remember, all our opinions are our own and do not represent those of our employers. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Hello and welcome to Perf Damage. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This is our very first video podcast. Yeah, we're upgrading. We are. We've had an audio podcast for what, about a year now? Yeah, it's been a year this month. Mm -hmm. 30 and episodes, guys. Yeah, Go I check know. them out. It's crazy. I feel proud that we've stuck with it this long. And as much as we don't want to be on camera, what we discuss is film. We discuss the history of movies. We take little stories behind a movie or an actor we focus on and we dive deep and we go down rabbit holes. And this is a podcast where we share that information with you. And since film is a visual medium and a lot of times it's hard to describe something that you're seeing, especially if you're describing a silent film, which we've done. Yeah, this will... Uh Stop all of our over explanation of everything. <laughs> yeah, trying to explain what's going on in a silent film. And then he walked down the stairs. Yeah. So, welcome. Yeah. So, um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about ourselves too and, yeah. and why, you know, we can bring kind of a unique perspective to this. Sure. Who so are you? I'm Adam and I worked in the, um, in development for 10 years. At film a development. Yep, film development at a major studio. Um, and I currently uh, work in production. Film production. Film production. Yeah. Although currently, thanks to the writer's strike. <laughs> currently, I don't work in any form. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is my job. <laughs> yes, it is. And my name is Charlotte. And we are a husband and wife team, if you didn't get that from the intro. And I work in film restoration. I oversee film preservation and restoration at a major motion picture studio, a.k.a. the coolest job in the world. And I have to do a lot of research for films. Yeah, that's kind of how this came about initially is like you'd come home and you'd start talking to me about something. And you'd yeah. be like, oh, man, you would not believe what I saw today or what <laughs> I heard about today. Or, oh, man, I uncovered this crazy story behind yeah. this picture. Yeah, me and my colleagues, we like to one up each other with the did you knows. Oh, yeah, behind we're the big things. into did you knows. Yeah, so we thought we love this stuff. We thought it would be really cool to share it with everybody. And we figured there's probably other film nerds out there that would like to hear these stories. So here we are. Oh, we know there are other film nerds out there. Yeah, we do. All right. So today we're going to talk about the 1951 Oscar ceremony. And specifically, we're going to get into the best actor category and take a look at the best actor winner, Jose Farrar, and really kind of examine his Oscar win and what was going on behind the scenes when he won that Oscar. Yeah, we're going to unpack that speech because um, there was a lot going on behind the scenes that uh, that gave all of the things that he said double meanings. Right. So you heard the speech at the beginning of this episode and, you know, he's it's kind of a normal speech. You don't really think much of it. It's very nice. But by the end of this episode, you're going to understand a lot more meaning and gather a lot more meaning from what he said in the speech. So to hear more, stay tuned. Okay, so maybe we should talk and give a little background on Jose Ferrar in case anybody's not familiar with the actor. Yeah, I mean, I was not very familiar with Jose Ferrar's work at all. I I grew up watching Miguel Ferrar mm -hmm. um, because of RoboCop, of course. RoboCop. What are your prime directives? Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law. That's good. That's very good. 
Miguel Ferrar was after that. I followed everything he did. I tried to see, but I didn't know. I I'd heard of Jose Ferrar. Yeah, I knew his dad was an actor. I hadn't Mr. seen Mr. Rosemary Clooney. Hadn't seen a lot of his work. No, to be honest, I don't think. I think I had, but I didn't really key into him because he's such a chameleon. Yeah, I mean, he's in he, Lawrence of Arabia and Dune, another one of my favorite Dune, movies. He's in that noir whirlpool. Yeah, Gene Tierney. He's in a lot. Anyhow, so he, let's do a little backstory. He was born in 1912 in Puerto Rico, and he moved to New York whenever he was six with his family, and that's where he did a lot of his growing up. He was big into playing piano, big into fencing, and fencing would come in handy with Cyrano de Bergerac. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Highly cultured. Mm -hmm. Highly cultured. He went to Princeton. He actually got admitted to Princeton when he was 15, but he didn't start until he was 16 because they said, hold up. Yeah, they wouldn't let him go because he was hold too young. Hold on now. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to Princeton and then he went to Columbia. And in college is where he got the acting bug. He didn't really act much before. So after college, he ended up moving to... He didn't move anywhere because he already lived in New York. No, he's, he stayed in New York. <laughs> yeah. After college, he began working in the theater and his first kind of early success was in this play called Charlie's Aunt, where he appeared in drag. Not a very attractive lady, <laughs> I have to say. Hey, I, I really wish I could have seen that. You could say bless his heart, though, for that, you know. Uh, I don't think that's quite a bless his heart. But. <laughs> so he appeared in that. That was successful. But it was his turn as Iago in the 1943 production of Othello that really made him a true star. And in that play, he appeared with his then wife, Uta Hagen and Paul Robeson, Uta Hagen and Paul Robeson ended up having an affair during that play. And Uta Hagen ended up leaving Jose Ferrar for Paul Robeson. And so that was the end of their marriage. In 1946, he starred in Cyrano de Bergerac, this is a role that would sort of define his career. You're way ahead of me on the wine. What is up with that? Because you're talking more than I am. I so, guess yeah. so. You're laying all the groundwork here. I am laying the groundwork. I did all the research. Not all of it. Not all of it. Yeah. You're right. Anyhow, so Cyrano de Bergerac, he's in this play in 1946, and then in 1947, he's nominated for a Tony. The very first Tony. The very first year of the Tonys. So he won the very first Best Actor Tony. He did. And it wasn't long after that that he said, see you Broadway, I'm going to Hollywood. In 1948, he appeared in his first film, Joan of Arc, where he played Daphne, and he was nominated for an Oscar. Best Supporting Actor in his, his very first, first role. role. Yeah. Very first role. Academy said, who's this guy? He didn't win. But he was very happy just to be nominated. Mm -hmm. So around the same time, uh, or really throughout his whole life, he was a big supporter of social progress. So while he was in New York, and then later when he was in Hollywood, he lent his name to a lot of progressive causes. He fought against segregation and against defending the freedom of expression. <laughs> I have notes. Notes. The same year that he won a Tony for Cyrano de Bergerac, he took a powerful stand against the House of Un-American Activities Committee, which we'll call HUAC from here out. Farrar added his name to a letter in 1947, vehemently condemning the committee's Hollywood investigations, which had resulted in the infamous blacklist of artists deemed undesirable due to their alleged communist affiliations. Yeah, but this wasn't uncommon at that time. A no. lot, a lot of major actors uh, were against UAC at the very beginning, mm -hmm. and taking a stand against it. Yeah, uh, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Danny Kaye—they all went to Washington D.C. and protested outside of the very first UAC uh, hearings. Right, and that was 1948. 48, 1948. Yep. So, so this was a very common thing, and also in Hollywood, there's all these stories about. How you never went to someone's house just for dinner to sit and chat, that it was always for a cause and there's always a master of ceremonies and there's always a collection basket passed around. So it's a very common thing at the time because there were a lot of causes that people felt strongly about. Yeah, it's no different now though. I mean, it's, it's still constant. You know, there are people that fundraise for all of these causes mm -hmm. and, and just like that, they celebrity hunt. They mm -hmm. need those big names 
to lend credence to them. And, uh, you know, and those big names, if they appear at the function, get other people to come Mm -hmm. and uh, the chance to meet them and hobnob with them Mm -hmm. gets them to loosen their pockets. Happens all the time in Hollywood still. Yeah. So a couple things that Jose Ferrar did, he supported the Republican cause in Spain. He gave a speech at a fundraising event for the Joint Anti-Fascist Refugee Committee in 1944 he appeared on behalf of the Spanish Refugee Appeal in 45, and he even sponsored the American Committee for Spanish Freedom in 1946. So long before he got to Hollywood, he was involved in a lot of causes. But it was the letter he signed in 1947 condemning HUAC that came back to haunt him. So the months leading up to the Academy Awards were nail-biting for Jose Ferrar. Speculation was rife with red paranoia, and people thought that it might influence the Academy Awards for the very first time. Ferrar's name appeared numerous times in trade papers like Variety and headline articles about communism in Hollywood. Headlines like Job Blues for Hollywood Reds weren't uncommon to see. On March 14, 1951, an article called Red charges for first time may exert influence on Oscar awards, told the story of the California Teachers Union, who decided to withdraw an individual award for Jose Ferrar for his performance in Cyrano de Bergerac as the best film of the year. The group decided not to award Ferrar a certificate of merit after Ward Bond, treasurer of the Right Wing Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, protested that the Teachers Association should not honor an actor who has supported, and associated with subversive organizations. Bond also went on to say that Ferrer is a great actor, but he should not represent the motion picture business. He should not be paid the highest honor of our industry. Ward Bond continued to protest Ferrer's Oscar nomination to anyone who would listen. He warned the Academy that an award for Ferrar or any of the other suspected communists would indicate that the Academy was either sound asleep or sympathetic to people of that group, people who are openly known to be sympathetic to subversive elements. Even after Farrar stated, I attest and will so swear under oath that I am not, have never been, could not be a member of the Communist Party, nor specifically am I a sympathizer with any communist aim, a fellow traveler, or in any way an encourager of any Communist Party concept or objective. Bond followed up Farrar's statement, saying that he did not believe his denial and said it was outright perjury. While everyone else was blaming television for recent box office declines, Bond blamed the communists in Hollywood. Bond said that he was carrying out his campaign because he is interested in trying to help our business to keep it alive. I want to oppose everything that is detrimental to the best interest of our industry. Hedda Hopper, another member of the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, a group that also included John Wayne, Walt Disney, and Howard Hughes, wrote similar, less factual-based stories in her gossip column when she called out suspected Hollywood communists in an attempt to root out the red from Hollywood. She seemed to have a bullseye squarely on Farrar, singling him out numerous times in articles leading up to the Academy Awards. This could only be considered... A smear campaign. The day before the Oscar ceremony, on March 28, 1951, a Variety article talked of Jose Farrar's plan to tell it all during his upcoming testimony in front of HUAC. The HUAC investigations were casting a shadow on the time leading up to the Academy Awards, but ultimately it didn't affect the outcome, at least not in the way that people were thinking it would, because Jose Farrar took home the Oscar for Best Actor for Cyrano de Bergerac. And I think we should take a moment to... A moment. I think think we should take a moment. (laughs) We should take a (laughs) moment. (laughs) You became Inspector Clouseau all of a sudden. (laughs) Would we have a wafer (laughs) during this moment? Yeah, we would. (laughs) 
let's talk about Cyrano de Bergerac for a second. Because, I don't know, when you put on that movie, within the first 10 minutes, you see why he won the Oscar. I clap my hands three times, thus. At the third, you will eclipse yourself. Ready? One. How dare you? I demand, I insist, I call upon all the nobles. This is an outrage. You hear an outrage. Nothing on earth will move me from this stage. Three. <laughs> Fair ladies and noble gentlemen. <laughs> Monsieur de Bergerac, why have you done this to Armand Foy, an admirable actor? I have two reasons, either one conclusive. First, he is an abominable actor who mouths his verse and moans his tragedy. Second, well, that's my secret. Well, I mean, this is the defining moment of his career. He created this character on Broadway for the very first time. And he embodied this character in a way that no one else has since or probably ever will. I mean, mm-hmm. it really was the the actual um, role that made him. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the only person to uh, garner a nomination um, for a Tony, an Oscar, and uh, an, Emmy. an Emmy. All for the same role. For the same role. Yeah, playing the same character. So uh, he actually, so he played in a Broadway. He won his Tony. And then uh, a year before the film came out, in 1949, NBC on Philco Television Playhouse produced an hour-long version. And he played Cyrano there. And that was his television debut. I'd love to see that. The very first time. Uh, so he was nominated for that as well, for an Emmy. That's incredible. Yeah, only guy to play the character on all three forms and get a nomination. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. So, yeah, from the moment, it's his voice and his command of language. He, yeah, he's very good with Shakespearean-style dialogue. Yeah, I mean, it's not Shakespearean. No, it's not. no, no. But there's a certain sort of cadence and feel to yes. that. And he's very natural delivering that. And, I mean, like you said, with his command of language, he actually spoke five languages. Yeah, it shows. I mean, th- mm-hmm. this guy speaks English like no one else. And when Cyrano at the beginning is making a fool of that other person at the play that he's at, and his command of language is evident over this other person. But he's doing something that you should hate his character because he's embarrassing someone. And yet. You don't because he's a cad in a fun way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just his ability is what makes him somebody that you're drawn to. Mm Mm-hmm. He's so smart and so interesting and and then well, he, it goes from wordplay to sword to play. Sword play. Yeah. And he's great with all of it. And like we said, he had a history of fencing, fencing. growing and it, up. And it shows. And it shows because yeah. he's very natural with that too. Yeah, I have a few things I I looked up about the film. Hit us with those facts. I got some facts for you. All right. Well, uh, so this was the first time that the um, novel Cyrano de Bergerac had ever been adapted to the screen. Although, and this is interesting, Universal tried to make it first. They optioned the rights to the book and they tried to make it starring Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. And it fell apart. I could see Laurence Olivier in the part. He's yeah, very Shakespearean I, as well. Yeah, and I think their romance would have been good. If I said one thing sort of... To critique Cyrano de Bergerac, like you said, it's the romance that doesn't really work. It's, and it's more the chemistry of the actress than anything else. Yes. Well, um, Mala Power, who played uh, Roxanne in the film, she was the producer's third choice. They went after Evelyn Keyes and Arlene Dahl beforehand. And because the film was made on a budget, like a serious budget, it was only a four hundred uh, million dollar. Sorry, four hundred. What? Sorry. <laughs> it was only a four hundred thousand dollar film, mm-hmm. uh, and it was shot in four weeks on six day weeks. Um, and it was shot with a very 
interesting lens. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know more about that. Well, than it's, I do. it says in the opening credits there, it's shot with the Garuzzo lens. It's supposed to have what increased depth of field or something. Yeah. It was touted as giving a deep focus effect, even at wide apertures. So this was achieved by some sort of a circular split diopter arrangement. If you've ever watched a Brian De Palma film, you've seen a split diopter. And that's, that's something that's put in front of the lens so they can have focus here and focus way behind. So if you know, a character's way behind someone, they can focus on the foreground and the background. And you can usually see there's a little line. Yeah, it's blur- that's it's kind of blurry kind of in the blurry. center. Yeah. Brian De Palma loves split diopters. He uses it in almost every film. And you still see it used today. So this lens had some sort of split diopter inside of it. It was used on a bunch of B Westerns, but then Stanley Kramer, who produced Cyrano de Bergerac, was really impressed enough and he actually used it on several productions. And there's over 30 films that were reportedly shot with this Garuzzo lens. So it could only be used, there was this weird thing with this lens that uh, it had color aberrations when shot with color films. So it could oh. only be used with black and white. Oh, wow. And it never really succeeded. It never really was officially, a, you know, in competition with 3D. Although right. 3D was so short-lived. Yeah, a couple of years. So. Yeah. As we talked about in our episodes. So... So to use the lens, the cameraman actually had to set up each shot very carefully and it involved adjusting the main aperture to balance the front aperture. So it was a lot of extra work. Cameramen hated it, but it was less of a nuisance than 3D. So it had that going for it, but ultimately it didn't have a lot going for it. But anyways, Cyrano is one of the few movies that were shot with this Garuzzo lens. That's interesting. Yeah. Maybe interesting to somebody. I thought it was cool. <laughs> to techie nerds. Yeah. This film had an issue with censorship. Well, you know. We hate censorship. Yeah, on Perf Damage, on the audio version of our podcast, we have broached this subject a lot. Yes. The Breen Office at the time, which was a precursor to the MPAA, or MPA now. They said that uh, they had to make over 10 changes in the script, anytime they invoke the name of God, it had to be changed. Even if that invocation was in French. <laughs> Mon d- Mon d- yeah, so- at this time, movies, um, at this time, people still had to submit scripts for them to be approved for approval. before they could be shot. In 1951, if people were watching the Oscars, most of those people had not seen Jose Ferrer's performance as Cyrano de Bergerac. Why is that? Um, it had only been released in New York and L.A. and wasn't released until July 20th, 1951. Oh, interesting. Everywhere else. That makes, you know, that makes a lot of sense because I've seen it credited as 1950 and 1951. Yes. So that's why. Yeah. You, when you're doing research, it's yeah. often, yeah. And that's that's the reason. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. Only in New York and L.A. at that point. Well, I bet by the time it came out, people said, I got to see this. Well, he won the Academy Award. He won the Academy Award. Oh. Must be good. He's got to be good in it. Well, so... Because <laughs> the Academy Award never picks anyone who's not good. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, that leads to the next thing. When the film came out, the reviews were sort of mixed. Uh, universally, Jose Ferrer was lauded as uh, giving a wonderful performance. But they savaged poor Mala Power, who played Aww. Roxanne. Uh, the New York Times said she was lovely, but lifeless. <laughs> and all those 14 years he has been the old friend who came to me to be amusing Roxanne it was you no no Roxanne no and I might have known it every time that I heard you speak my name no it was not I it was you I swear and they also um, all brought up the idea that it was a, it looked low budget and it was very stagey looking. Well, it's based on a play. I mean, that's sort of a that critique a, that happens a lot. I mean, lot. it happens a lot now, too, in adaptations. You know, speaking of mixed reviews, Stephen King says. Yes. And if Stephen King says it, we know it's true. It's true or it's fact. We got a little Stephen King thing right back here. Stephen King says, you know, you've done well. If you get mixed reviews when you release a book, because you must have done something right if people feel strongly about it. Either either way, way. either Mm -hmm. way, right? Yeah, that's cool. So 
There you go. Serenade of Bergerac. Yeah. The film fell into public domain in the mid-1980s. It was inducted into the National Film Registry in, I think, 2021. Oh, wow. Recently, then. Yeah, very recently. Right after the, the new remake came out. It's been remade a bunch. Lots. Jose Ferrar, not always a fan of the remakes. So, anyway. So, that's Cyrano. Yeah. He wins the Oscar. Jose Ferrar takes it home. So, two months later, he had to go and give testimony in mm -hmm. front of the HUAC committee. Right. And they asked him specifically, did you give a speech at this thing? Did you attend this meeting? Did you sign this awful thing? Well, we know you did because we see your name. And and Frank Tavener, who was on the council for HUAC, even asked him specifically, weren't you aware of the Communist Party infiltration into these organizations? He denied all knowledge of that. He said he's since become aware that some of the things that he was a part of were ultimately, you know, sponsored by or were communist. fronts. They yeah. were fronts for communists to launder money to them, basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that. I mean, I know that a lot of celebrities lend their names to things now that they have no clue who's behind the yeah, and back or, then you couldn't just Google it. Right. So I think it would be a little bit harder to know. Ultimately, you hear that Spanish refugees need help. I'm going to lend my name. This is something I can do to help. Right. After the testimony, he said that he was um, a victim of celebrity hunting. I, did I say that already? I don't know if you did. Okay. Even if you did, it's good. Yeah. So, you know, say it twice. Because that's true. I mean, that's what they did. They mm -hmm. sought out celebrities to get people to give money. Mm -hmm. So He was cleared of any wrongdoing. He didn't get blacklisted. There are rumors that he gave up four names to avoid being blacklisted, although that hasn't been explicitly confirmed. There is a biography where... I forget who the biography's on. I thought I had it written down, but maybe I don't. Some lady. I don't remember. Some lady. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no transcription of, of this, so we don't know for a fact. No, but But a lot of the private testimonies when people had to name names were, were always sealed. Mm -hmm. Like Elia Kazan's. No one actually knows. They know he named names, but they don't know who. Um, yeah. So we don't know for sure if that's what happened, but his name was cleared and he wasn't blacklisted. However, not everyone who worked on Cyrano de Bergerac was as lucky as Jose Ferrar. So a few of the other people, actually, you know, before I say this, I got to mm -hmm. wet the whistle. <laughs> wet your whistle. You need to wet your whistle. So let's talk about some of the other people that worked on Cyrano de Bergerac that were affected by the blacklist. So the director of Cyrano de Bergerac, Michael, Michael Gordon. Gordon. Uh, was named as a former Communist Party member by directors Edward Dimitrick and Frank W. Tuttle in their HUAC testimony. Gordon invoked the Fifth Amendment when called before HUAC and was blacklisted from the film industry until he testified cooperatively before the committee in 1958. So he was blacklisted for seven years. Yeah. But during that time, he went to New York. He worked on Broadway. Directed plays there. Mm-hmm. But then came back, testified in 58. He was unblacklisted. And then he directed a little movie. That was big in your house. That was big in my house. Mom, if you're listening, and I know you are, Pillow Talk. Every Sunday. This is the director of Pillow Talk. We're talking about Michael Gordon. You should know this name. I read that he got a call from a, a producer buddy who said, hey, I think it's safe for you to come back now. All you got to do is go and testify and name people that you already know have, have been named. Right. And so that's what he did. And went on to make some some comedy. Yeah, after that he became like a romantic giant comedy ro romantic comedy yeah. director because that movie was so successful. Another person who was affected by the blacklist who worked on Cyrano de Bergerac was the writer Carl Foreman. You may have heard his name before. We've mentioned him in our Blacklist and Five Branded Women episodes. Yeah, our audio podcast. So Carl Foreman, he's got a really interesting story that was happening around the same time that he was blacklisted and Cyrano de Bergerac came out around High Noon. His work on High Noon intersected with the period of the second Red Scare after World War II and the Korean War. 
he was called before HUAC when he was writing High Noon. And by then, he had not been a member of any American Communist Party for nearly 10 years. And because he declined to name names or identify other people, he was classified as uncooperative and was blacklisted by HUAC. This put a monkey wrench in High Noon because mm-hmm. um, he was the writer for uh, Stanley Kramer. Mm-hmm. Stanley Kramer and him formed their company together, and he was uh, an active member of their production company. Yeah, and he said it sort of changed how he approached writing High Noon because he realized as he was testifying that HUAC were sort of the bad guys in the movie. They were the brothers. Yeah, so while he was writing it, he used the the whole Red Scare situation as an allegory while writing the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really changes how you see High Noon if you watch it after knowing that. Yeah, it makes sense. The mm-hmm. soul man against uh, a kind of faceless group. Yeah, they're in. yeah they're coming in, and he's the only one that'll stand up against them. Because yeah, he everybody asks else is everybody slip. for help, yeah. and no one will help him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. it makes a lot of sense. It does. Stanley Kramer was afraid of uh, the blacklist, like everybody was at this point. Mm-hmm. And he wanted Carl Foreman to testify and name. Yeah, names he wanted him to name names so he didn't that want it, him they to could plead the fifth. Mm-hmm do business as usual. Right. Um, you know, he was the producer and Carl Foreman was the creative. And they had a production company together at the time. Yes, they did. Yep. Right. Uh, and he was their, the guy that wrote all of Stanley Kramer stuff. Right. And they were on a real and kick at this point. They had just signed a deal with Columbia uh, and they owed Columbia six pictures a year, which was a major, That's major a uptick. Yes. Yeah. They usually produced one to two movies a year because they were privately financed. So once Columbia came in, they owed six pictures a year. Wow. Actually, High Noon was supposed to go before Cyrano de Bergerac, but because of all of the HUAC stuff, they kind of postponed it for a little while. I thought there was some kind of rights situation. Yeah, maybe for the novel or something. Yeah, there was yeah. something with the rights that that was another reason why it was, was another postponed. reason why it was postponed. Yeah. During the production of the film, Stanley Kramer basically kicked Carl Foreman out of the production company. He made him sell his shares to him. Tried, and that was tried to bar he, him from set because he was trying to distance he, himself. Yeah, he didn't want to be associated right. with, you don't want to own a company with, with a communist. With a communist, exactly, at that point. Yeah. Um, he thought it was going to kill the Columbia deal. He was very, very afraid of killing the Columbia deal. Yeah, I mean, as he should have been. Yeah, because of the way people That was a very real at that, threat at the time. Unfortunately, Carl Foreman was pushed out of the company at this point, uh, and he tried to bar him from set. But, Gary Cooper, this is during the, the production of High Noon. Um, Carl Foreman oversaw the, the production on set because he part of the production company. Mm-hmm. And he got really close with Gary Cooper. He got really close with Fred Zinneman, who was also part of their collective. Mm-hmm. The director. Yep. And the two of them came to his defense. And they said, hey, we want Carl Foreman to be here. We don't want you to push him off set. Stanley Kramer said, tough luck. Sorry, I got to do it. But... The, there were some outstanding um, papers that Carl Foreman hadn't signed uh, because he was a member of the production company that had to do with their loan to cover the production of the film. And so he refused to sign them unless he could see the production nice. of the film all the way through. Good on you. Yeah. That was ultimately what drove the major nail between the two of them. Uh, and their separation because Stanley Kramer felt that he had been one upped by him. And he said to him, you won this one, but this is the last one. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, you know, he was, he's trying to save his deal, his, yeah, his entity that yeah, they had built from scratch. So, oh, and then also after he was pushed out, after the, the film was finished, Carl um, Foreman, the writer, Carl F- Foreman, the writer, decided to form his own production company. And Gary Cooper, who was so close to him, decided he was going to invest in it. That's cool. But because he refused to name names and was labeled as an unfriendly, the when the news came out in uh, all of the, in Variety, and, and they smeared Gary Cooper as being a commie Aww. lover. And Gary Cooper had to pull out because they said that they would ruin his career. <laughs> well, if they he probably didn't. would have. And they would have. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. But Gary Cooper was there to stand with his friend and was the first money in on his production company, which never actually happened. So, 
Oh. Yeah. Carl Foreman ended up moving to London, right? Mm-hmm. He ended up being an expat with a lot of uh, mm-hmm. a lot of labeled communists during that time. And he was one of the writers on Bridge on River Kwai, which won the Academy Award for writing. He wrote Bridge on River Kwai with Michael Wilson, who was also blacklisted at the time. And neither one of them got credit on the film when the film was released. And the credit on the screenplay was given to Pierre Bull, who had written the novel that the movie was based on. But... Pierre didn't speak English. But. <laughs> <laughs> and that really drove both Michael Wilson and Carl Foreman crazy. In 1984, the Writers Guild of America started giving credits to blacklisted writers and sort of reinstating their credits. And what that means is they officially recognize that they both wrote the film, which means they both got Academy Awards for writing the film. So, but unfortunately, they were both dead at the time. Posthumous Academy Awards. Yeah. Which is really heartbreaking. Okay, so the other person that worked on Cyrano de Bergerac that was affected by the blacklist that we're going to talk about is actor Morris Karnofsky. Before you say that, can I say um, we talk about Michael Wilson in depth during our Five Branded Women in the Blacklist uh, two part episode? on our audio only podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go into a lot about that. So if you want to know more about him, definitely check that out. Yeah, we also sort of go into the ethics of when the Writers Guild officially acknowledges that this person worked on this film, what are the ethics of updating that on a restoration of that film yeah, like a new transfer of do the film. you update it to right or wrong do you not update it to keep historical records as they were at the time so this is this is something that we get into a lot on that and it's honestly it's a thing that comes up a lot at work in different yeah it's a forms. good conversation it, it really is. is yeah yeah so if you want to hear more about michael wilson i i highly recommend checking out that episode five branded women and the blacklist so the last person we're going to highlight that was affected by the blacklist who worked on Cyrano de Bergerac is actor Morris Karnofsky. He was an alumni of a left-leaning group theater that came under attack, and he was called before HUAC as a member of a communist front. But he refused to provide the committee with the names of others, and as a result, was blacklisted. But later on, after he was sort of unblacklisted, he was being interviewed, and he had a really kind of a different kind of take on his experience having been blacklisted. He chose to have more of a positive outlook on a really dark thing that happened to him. And he said, as an experience, it was revolting, injurious, hurtful, but in an odd way, it nurtured me, strengthened me, made me hard, objective. And to that degree, I think it fed me as an actor. Yeah, I mean, that's um, a unique take on it Mm because everything else we've read by everybody else. Yeah, well, I mean, he says, yeah, it sucked, but I tried to do take that and channel it into acting and passion. And and it made me better at what Mm -hmm. I do. Well, he ended up going to work on Off-Broadway. Yeah, while he was blacklisted, blacklisted. similar to Michael Gordon, the director, he went to Broadway. A lot of people did. Yeah, a lot of them weren't doing the equity Broadway shows they were doing sort of smaller off, off Broadway. smaller shows yeah mm-hmm. so that or going to Europe or Mexico or yeah. wherever left all of this talent just fled but some of it came back eventually That's there forever. Yes. All right. So all of this leads us back to the 1951 Oscar ceremony and Jose Farrar's speech. He thanked Stanley, which is Stanley Kramer, the producer. Thanked Mike Gordon, who is Michael Gordon, the director, who was blacklisted. He thanked Carl Foreman, also blacklisted. He thanked the cinematographer, Franz Planer. Uh, George Glass, who was... He's credited as associate producer, but he worked with Stanley Kramer. He was basically Stanley Kramer's second. Yeah. yeah his guy. Company. Yeah. 
He also thanked actress Mala Powers. She's the one that got ravaged <laughs> in all of the reviews. Mm-hmm. He thanked Bill Prince, also an actor, William Prince. And then he thanked Morris Karnofsky, also blacklisted. He said to them, All of you, you know as well as I do that it's your Oscar as much as it is mine. But the line that really carries extra weight is the line when he addresses the Academy. Also to you, ladies and gentlemen of the Academy, who voted for me, you must know that this means more to me than just the honor accorded to an actor. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for what I consider a vote of confidence and an act of faith. And believe me, I will not let you down. He is absolutely talking about the HUAC investigations. Yeah, this He's- has double meaning yeah he's thanking them for believing in him and for not turning their backs on him because he's under investigation by huac right because when you win an academy award you're voted on by your peers so basically what he saw this as was an acquittal in their eyes in his peers eyes they don't believe that he was ever a communist uh, or that he is un-american in any way right Just listening to that speech, when you know the backstory, it just means so much more. The words have different weight. Yeah, they have a different weight. It's not just a thank you, I appreciate it, this for all of us, I'm out. Yeah. When you know all all of the things that were happening behind the scenes, you realize that he wasn't talking just about winning this award. He's talking about thank you for for your belief in the fact that I am not guilty of being a communist yeah and as you see in the clip he wasn't actually at the oscar ceremony because he was in new york rehearsing a play that he was directing and starring in with gloria swanson right who was also in new york alongside judy holiday who was in new york jose ferrar threw a big party and it was for gloria swanson's birthday which had happened two days before and for the Oscar ceremony. So they all got together and they were watching together. And there was this amazing photo when his name is announced. And you see Gloria Swanson is just has her hands in the air. She's so excited she's for so him. She's so happy. Yeah. And Judy Holiday, I think, is, you know, she almost looks like she's choking him. She's so happy for him. It's, yeah. I love the photo. And this is before she was announced. Yeah, right? she was the she was announced shortly after Judy Holiday for winning Best Actress against glory you know she was up against gloria swanson i would have loved to have seen right a picture to then no gloria swanson was very very gracious, gracious to really? her yes she said she leaned over and she said darling couldn't you have waited another year <laughs> <laughs> to her the ever gracious gloria swanson class act contrary to you know kind of her Norma repu- Desmond. her reputation mm-hmm. in hollywood this was his basic acquittal in Hollywood's eyes. Jose Ferrars, yeah. Yeah. And just two years later, he gets nominated for Best Actor again. In 52? 1952. Moulin Rouge. He oh, yeah. plays Toulouse Lautrec. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got into this really difficult rig to be short. Yeah. For I, it. He strapped his um His legs, legs behind, yeah. Behind him behind and walked him. on his uh, knees. Knees, yeah. But you know what I want to talk about? I think I do know what you want to talk about. I want to talk about a movie that kind of falls between these two. A movie that's kind of overshadowed by these two towering performances. It's a littler film. A littler. It's Liller. Even Liller than (laughs) Toulouse-Lautrec and Moulin Rouge? Well, I don't know if it's that low. But uh, yeah, it's a a movie called Anything Can Happen came out in 1952 as well. And because it was sandwiched between these two Oscar-nominated performances, I think it's kind of a forgotten film at this Mm -hmm. point. And we both love it. Yeah, this is sort of a hidden gem. It's about the immigrant experience Mm -hmm. in America. And this one's very, very positive, which was one of the things that kind of got dinged for in reviews. But, I mean, it is a delightful film. Yeah, it really goes against all the sort of the tropes that you think it's going to go for. At the beginning, they're meeting with the immigration officer. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Where's your landing card? He does not speak much oh. English. Just how are you? He's from Kartli, part of Georgia. Thanks, I'll get a Russian interpreter. Say, John. Won't do no good. 
He does not speak Russian. His language in Russian is the same as Chinese and English. It's very different. Not only language, but music, people, everything. Do you understand him? If he speaks Kartli, no. When he speaks Turkish, yes. He lived many years in Turkey. I meet him there. I speak for him. What's the matter with him? He's very worried to be stranger in strange land. And not to speak language, he's afraid people will not make welcome. Tell him the only thing to remember is that we are all foreigners here. The only difference is some came early, some came late. You know something? Right now, at this moment, you are the very latest. Congratulations. He's, He's so nice to he them. He says, welcome to America. Yeah. I hope you do well. The most interesting thing about this is that it's based on a, a novel. The character in the film is named Georgi Papishvili. And that is a, an actual human being, a person. Um, a real guy. A real dude. And it started out as a series of articles that he wrote for magazines. Uh, and then he collected those articles into a, a novel. Um, and so... It kind of has, what, kind of like a broken structure, like... Yeah, it feels very vignette vignette yeah. Halfway through the film, it sort of goes in a different direction. You think that it's, it starts off one way where he's a musician, and you think he's kind of going to... Get a success, you'd be a successful yeah, musician. Yeah, and then he ends up not and going a different way, and I don't really want to give it away. This movie is on YouTube. You can watch it as of today. <laughs> the link's been there for four years we checked so yes. hopefully it'll be there for a while but i highly recommend it and i don't want to give too much of it away because it's such a delight to unfold in front of you georgie papishvili feels real mm-hmm. feels like a real person yeah and the the most wonderful thing about this film are all the characters that he surrounds himself with they feel real and in in Jose Ferrar is such a strong actor that he sets back and lets these character actors yeah. kind of take over in all of these scenes. And so even though he's the lead of the film, the characters that surround him really make the film. Like the guy that plays Tariel, um, <laughs> who used to be a ship's captain in Georgia mm-hmm. and now wants to navigate across America using a compass. Yeah. And anytime anybody wasn't going exactly north, he would be like, what are you doing? Or exactly west. He wants to drive and he says, we don't need a map. We just go straight towards where the sun is setting and that's what will get us to California. And they say, no, that's not how you get to California. <laughs> and there's this moment where everybody falls asleep in the car and he's driving. He gets his moment. He gets his moment. And there's a fork in the road and he can stay on the paved road or he can go on the dirt road. <laughs> and he goes on the dirt yes, road. Yes, he does. Because and that's the way the compass told him to go. Hilarity ensues. Oh, it's so good. Yes. <laughs> This film, Anything Can Happen, won the Golden Globe for Best Film Promoting International Understanding. (laughs) What? Which was a category from 1946 to 1964. That's a real thing. Other winners include... (laughs) In 1946, the very first winner was The House I Live In, starring Frank Sinatra. Have you seen that? I have not. I have not either. I have not seen that film. I need to watch it. I have no clue how that actually fits in. The final winner was Lilies of the Field, 1964, starring Sidney Sidney Poitier. Poitier. But oddly enough... The weirdest one. The weirdest winner of this award... Well, the one that jumps out at you, at least. Is... The Day the Earth Stood Still. (laughs) What? (laughs) Which we think maybe it's because it's the allegory for the Cold War, right? Right, right. but but uh, I mean it's alien acceptance because is that what it is? Like, <laughs> is that what they're preaching are they, to? You? Are aliens international? Oh, well, they're definitely like well, not they're not even national. Is it like international understanding because people can communicate with them? Well, is it intergalactic understanding? It they should be intergalactic. They should have done it understanding. that year. Should yeah. have been intergalactic. May, maybe they did. Maybe it was a international slash intergalactic, intergalactic that year. understanding. <laughs> it was like we saw that. I was like, what is this? Look, we haven't done a lot of research into this thing. We just sort of saw this. So yeah, 
I didn't know it existed. I didn't either. <laughs> yeah, you, you pulled that up. I was like, what? It's like, have you ever heard of this? I was like, nope, 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 nope. Yeah. Right. I think we should wrap this up. Yeah. Might as well. Right. Yeah. So thanks for joining us as we talk about the 1951 Oscar ceremony and the story behind Jose Ferrar's win Wait. for best actor. We didn't even talk about the Academy Award being stolen. Which oh you teased at the beginning. God, yeah. we didn't. So, <laughs> that brings us to the Missing Academy Award. Adam, what's the story with this? We teased it at the beginning. Two weeks after receiving the Academy Award, Jose 1951. Ferrar dedicates that to uh, Puerto Rican College? University. University. Uni of Puerto Rico. Yeah, the University of Puerto so Rico. So, he did that... Before he testified in front of HUAC. Yep. Yes, he did. So he, he had it for two weeks. And it then... was only in his possession for two weeks. Then he gave it to Puerto Rico yeah. as a sign of, you know, hey, I support you. And well, I mean, it was the first Academy Award won by, by a, a Latin Latino. American. Yeah. So yeah. he obviously very proud of it and probably thought that it would be more inspirational. Or... To people that live there. Yeah, yeah. that could see yeah. it than just, you know, on a on a shelf. So I get it. So it lived there for, for years and years and years, years How and many years, years and years, uh, until 2000. Where did it go? Well, the story is that it was misplaced in 2000 during some renovations. Uh, it lived in the theater there in Puerto Rico in the university and, uh, they were renovating it and it was misplaced and then it went missing. So I'm not sure how something is misplaced first and then goes missing because isn't it missing when it goes misplaced? <laughs> isn't that how it works? Well, maybe someone stole it and then admitted and then that they misplaced it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the person that stole it forgot where they put it. So you look, they, they admitted to the crime, but they said, look, I, I don't remember where I put it. Let's be honest. That's something that you would do. No, actually, no one admitted to the crime. No one knows where it went. It just disappeared. Basically, that's the university stance on it. Um, so, misplaced first, then stolen. That's so weird. Why say that? Just say stolen. I know. That's what the news article said. Like, if, it, if you misplaced it, how do you actually know that it's stolen? Yeah, maybe they just lost it. Maybe it got, like, walled up or something during the renovation. Oh, they're going to open a wall and find and it. And find it from years from now. Yeah, anyone with an old house, you know what we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. So after this happened, Miguel Ferrar, Jose Ferrar's son, son of Rosemary Clooney as well. And star of RoboCop. Star of RoboCop. He reached out to the Academy and he tried to get a replacement, but they said no because Jose Ferrar was no longer with us. And they said they do not replace Academy Awards for deceased winners. Which is pretty good crappy. Miguel Ferrar spoke to the Hollywood Reporter about this and he said the Academy is tripping over themselves to be culturally inclusive but my dad won an Oscar in 1951 with an un-anglicized name the first Hispanic to ever win an Oscar and the Academy is so intractable to this day. No matter what he did he tried to you know slander him in the press and everything but they they still, they, they took still, a hard stance on that one. Yeah. And then sadly, Miguel passed away not yeah. long after that, because that was in 2016, whenever he was making a big deal about that. I mean, that was 16 years after. Yeah, that's the crazy. Thing it happened. You would think that they would want something culturally significant like that to be kind of a, a beacon for people, you know, to, to look at, to enjoy. Yeah. Um, anyway, interesting. Yeah. And that's the mystery of the missing yeah, Oscar. do you know where it is? If you know, maybe you could help solve the mystery. <laughs> I wanted to say that. Yeah, there you go. Take that, Robert Stack. <laughs> I think we should just go to the University of Puerto Rico's theater and just start bashing holes in the wall. Yeah. I think we'll find it. I think they'll be totally cool with that. Yeah, nobody will know. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining us on our very first video podcast episode um this is weird well it's an adventure not gonna lie it's gonna be an adventure guys it is 
So yeah, we appreciate you joining us for maybe some wine. Hopefully you grabbed a bottle and joined us. Maybe not a whole bottle, but you know, a glass or hey, two. You do you, you guys. Do you. Yeah, if you want a whole bottle, you drink it. You deserve it. People work hard. <laughs> <laughs> If you have a favorite Jose Ferrar film, please recommend it. Yeah, recommend it. Leave a comment if there's something that we left out that we should look at because we're going through a huge Jose Ferrar kick right now. And we didn't even mention all the ones that we've watched recently, but we did mention our, our favorites. Yeah, and if you have any ideas for stories or things you want us to research, we'd love to hear from that as well. Just send us an email or a note. All of that information is in the show notes. Yeah, so until next time, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Here on Perf Damage. But... It was the letter that he signed in 1947 condemning Hewak.